Welcome back to Whistle Where You Work. The new administration in Washington has brought significant changes in orientation. One of the most striking is in the area of climate disruption and global warming. Rick Piltz had a bird's eye view of how climate policy was formulated in the Bush administration. Piltz was a senior associate in the office that coordinates government climate research. And from that perch, he discovered and publicly disclosed that the White House, staffed by oil lobbyists, was doctoring climate science to downplay dangers and exaggerate uncertainties. Rick Piltz now directs Climate Science Watch, a project of the Government Accountability Project. Welcome, Rick, back to Whistle Where You Work. Now, tell me, what did you do exactly at the Climate Change Science Program? Well, I was there for 10 years from the mid-1990s uh, uh, onward, and uh, this is the office that um, is, um, works to coordinate $2 billion worth of climate research and observations by about a dozen federal agencies. Now, we didn't actually spend that $2 billion. That's in the agencies. But I developed and put together the annual report to Congress on the program and other communications. We were involved in strategic planning, getting the agencies to work together kind of a senior advisory capacity to this federal uh, senior climate science technocrats who ran these programs and, and funded the leading scientists. And just to be clear, are you yourself a climate scientist? Well, my academic training was in political science and I got involved with the global warming problem 20 years ago from the policy side and then worked for the House Science Committee for a while and got much closer to the science community. So at this point, I think I know more about the science than most political people and more about politics than most scientists. So on a good day, I'm sort of a bridge between those, those two worlds. One of the people you encountered while you were working at this program was someone named Phil Cooney. Tell me about him. Well, Phil Cooney uh, is someone I've uh, come to learn more about uh, uh, over time. But uh, he came in as the chief of staff at the Council on Environmental Quality. That's the White House Environmental a policy office and along about 2002 started to become very visible and very aggressive. Where did he come from? Well he had been at the American Petroleum Institute that's the trade association lobbying arm of the big oil companies. He was their climate team leader and I believe in that context it meant making sure that the administration and Congress didn't adopt the Kyoto Protocol on climate change and headed off regulation of greenhouse gases to make a long story short. And with the Bush uh, Cheney administration, he became kind of an inside man. But he went beyond the policy role to start uh, involving himself directly in communications from the science program. And that's uh, where I encountered him because in reports to Congress, that among other things would have statements about the state of scientific understanding of climate change and what issues were being studied. Uh, these things were drafted by uh, dozens of experts, scientists, science managers, approved by all the agencies and then sent to the White House for final clearance. And they would come back with his hand markup with a large number of changes, all of which it was immediately apparent to me had involved processing it through the screen of playing down the global warming problem, taking out discussion of climate change impacts, creating an atmosphere of a fundamental scientific uncertainty about all of this. And it clearly wasn't an attempt to enhance or make more accurate the science communication. It was to, to conform the science statements to the White House's political agenda. And they came my way because I was working on these documents and I looked at it and I thought, Wow, this is not, this is not right. This is not. This is different from something we had seen under the previous administration. And when them, did you first get become wary of uh, what you were getting back from uh, the White House Council on Environmental Quality? Well, he had been a bit under uh, my radar screen for a while, but it was in the fall of 2002. I'd started to see him at meetings of the principals level. Uh, directors of the program that I was staffing in that summer. But in the fall, uh, he started um, really marking things up. And it was shortly after uh, William O'Keefe from the American Petroleum Institute, who was also the uh, chairman of the George Marshall Institute, which I consider to be part of the global warming disinformation campaign, had written a letter to 
President Bush's chief of staff, Andy Card, saying, you need to get these people in your administration on message on climate change and make sure that everybody is talking the same way. You need a czar to police these communications. And uh, Mr. O'Keefe um, copied that letter over to Phil Cooney, and it was shortly thereafter that Cooney started to become very aggressive at policing climate change communications. Tell me about your decision to leave the government and reveal what you knew about this. Well, it was a long accumulation of things. I finally left at the, pretty much at the beginning of 2000 at the beginning of President Bush's second term, uh, the situation had become very corrosive to my morale, and particularly if your interest is in that communication between scientists and policymakers, um, to have uh, political operatives interfering with that communication, and for there to be nothing you could do about it, really, without, I mean, immediately being run off. And I could see that uh, the media wasn't covering it uh, properly. It was not being raised and it was partly because this was so inside in a way. People couldn't really get a handle on what was going on. Because so some was, of the changes he made were at least superficially subtle changes, weren't they? Subtle changes, that's right. And you, if you've ever edited a document you know that you don't have to change too many, do too many deletions and insertions and, and altering uh, text here and there to change the tone, to change um, the message and um, so the media was still basically portraying this as some kind of a debate about science or a fundamental scientific debate where the industry people had known since the mid 1990s about what the scientists were saying about the reality and implications of human driven climate change. But that the isn't what the industry was saying publicly? No absolutely not. The oil industry's own scientists were telling them human-driven global warming is real, but they made a political decision in the interest of warding off regulation of their product to fund instead a bunch of front groups who kind of spun up a denial machine to, to create a sense that this was a fundamental scientific uncertainty. It, was, it bore a certain kind of resemblance to what the tobacco industry had done for a number of years before that, and actually some of, there was some overlap in the cast of characters once, once you really investigate it. Um, but um, the fact that these guys knew, they knew better, but they had chosen for political reasons, for economic interests, for ideological reasons, for reasons not wanting to have a proactive government problem-solving role to spin the message a different way. So what happened when you left the government? Did, did that get, uh, bring about the change you were hoping for? Well, um, I finally decided to resign with the intention of going public. And so I took with me uh, copies of a number of key documents and uh, I turned them over to Andrew Revkin at the New York Times who um, is probably the leading uh, print journalist in the country on global environmental issues. I, I knew that he, he understood the program, he understood the issues. And he did a front page story in June of 2005, um, White House aid edited climate reports, in which he laid it out. And it was a good story. It was just one particular slice. I never regarded this one individual as being the sole problem. He was a, a, a perfect example of a broader pattern of misrepresenting the intelligence that this administration was into. And I was looking at the global warming piece of it. And uh, a couple of days later, he resigned from the White House uh, which really struck me because their modus operandi was usually to sh be impervious, to sort of convey the impression that nothing you could do would in and so he resigned. And I thought, wow, that's very interesting. And then a couple of days after that, it was announced that he had taken a position with ExxonMobil. Which at the time was leading the campaign. Which uh, was the principal funder of, of the, the global denial warming campaign. denial machine. That's right. So I thought, well, that's more like it. I mean, that's... Makes you know, sense. That makes sense. That's that's the, that's the boot in your face that shows them how much they care. What you was there think. a pushback against you when you left the administration for what you were saying? I was given to understand that uh, there was a sort of behind-the-scenes investigation of me from a Senate committee chairman and from people in the White House. Who was this guy? What was he doing in that office? What? How did he have this stuff? What was that about? Um, but um, 
I'd gone to the Government Accountability Project and gotten legal counsel on that. I, my impression, I mean, I hadn't taken anything classified and I hadn't, um, I had left the program. It seemed to me that I was probably well within my rights as a citizen. Um, I, was, I was calling attention to a abuse of, of power, I would say, and uh, I was reassured by counsel that that was in fact the case. So in fact, nothing ever happened to me. I think I was just a thorn in their side and they um, just wanted the story to blow over. It was an embarrassment, but it And you continued to be a thorn in their, their side, you know, the di denial machine through Climate Science Watch. But I wanted to ask you about the Obama administration. And in its early days, there have been appointments, there have been statements, there have been initiatives. Tell me if you think that there is a clear break from the Bush administration's climate policies and climate integrity policies? All of the signals are that there is a, a clear break or that, that they've announced an intention to make a clear break. And I mean, none of the administrations are above criticism, but I did think that the Bush-Cheney administration was, was a different animal we were dealing with. They were doing something with intelligence that was not characteristic of absolutely everyone. They were over the line. Um, so uh, I think that the tone that's been set by the president in terms of ex acknowledging the reality of the climate change problem, some of the high-level appointments, the president's science advisor that we have now, John Holder, and I think is a big improvement over his predecessor and his willingness to tell a straight story. But uh, from our investigation of this problem, there's a pervasive problem in the federal agencies that tends to, to not really promote really free communication between federal scientists and wider audiences. And we've made a lot of recommendations about you know, but has me it, media policies and talking to reporters. And I think they're maybe not, not necessarily self-implementing. I mean, we're going to have to be watchdogging the new administration to make sure that those changes are really happening. We only have a minute left, but hasn't the president issued an executive order on scientific integrity and, and uh, put his uh, name behind the idea that there shall be an unfettered scientific debate and, uh, and ability to investigate by federal scientists? Yes, and I think that was very solid. And uh, I think we just need to make sure that at the level of career people in the agencies that that's really happening, that those channels of communication between scientists and society are really open. But I have high expectations for major improvements and hopefully we can get past this period of egregious censorship toward a more proactive approach to putting society on the road to dealing with the problem, this, the climate change problem. And, we still have to hold government officials accountable for taking the science, embracing it, using it, and doing something with it, and solving real problems. And Washington is still not doing that. Well, many thanks to Rick Piltz for having the courage to put your personal well-being at risk to ensure that the public and policymakers knew the truth about climate science and how it was being manipulated by the Bush White House. Welcome back to Whistle Where You Work. I'm Mark Cohen, and we're talking with Robert McLean, a former air marshal, who has a story uh, that you're going to want to hear. Uh, welcome to Whistle Where You Work. Thank you for having me. Uh, right after 9/11, I was uh, I was recruited by the uh, the at the time the Federal Aviation Administration Federal Air Marshal Program, and I was. Uh, in the first class of 35 air marshals to graduate uh, after the 9-11 attacks. And what kind of training is involved in being an air marshal? 
it's a lot of uh, a lot of scenario training, so that you it's obviously firearms is 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 a huge part of it, but more important than than firearms training is to how to react and control many different scenarios. Um, you have to it's a it's a close quarter environment, and therefore you have to be. Precisely. When you say close quarter, we're talking about you are on a flight. Correct. Uh, are you um, uh, in uniform when you're on the flight, uh, walking up and down the aisle, uh, brandishing a badge? What are you doing? No. Uh, originally, the program was was like that when it was when it was run by mostly uh, special forces and former local police department uh, veterans, and we were. We were very undercover, and we the passengers uh, were not supposed to know who we are, and we sat in in areas that were most uh, tactical, and we boarded tactically, so nobody knew uh, could uh, figure out our identity or our positions. It was very well run in the in the very beginning, considering uh, what had just happened in the in the attacks. And was the program uh, substantially beefed up after 9-11? Uh, about, I graduated in, uh, in mid-November, and it wasn't f until probably four or five months later where classes after classes after classes were pumping out students. And for instance, the program that I was in and the academy classes there were there were very high shooting standards and very intense, but after a lot of people were failing the 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 uh, the firearms requirements, uh, they started to lessen the requirements so that they can put more people through, and they also shortened the uh, the academy training time. Now, in June two thousand three, the Department of Homeland Security and uh, the Federal Air Marshal Service is uh, under TSA, which is under the Department of Homeland Security, right? Uh, yes. uh, the Department of Homeland Security issued a warning stemming from a failed hijacking plot. And then just a few days later, uh, you became aware of some intelligence information. Uh, tell us what that was. It was actually uh, July 26th of 2003. And it was a, the alert was so First of all, there, there was it was unprecedented where our special agent in charge of our office, who was a retired former FBI director, he required, he was so sensitive, this threat, that he wanted every single one of us not to get security briefings by phone or email. He required all of us to walk into our field office, regardless of your of your duty status, and to and to listen on this briefing. And the briefing was very detailed. There was uh, there was a plot of of suicide hijacking terrorists that were going to exploit an immigration loophole, where it allowed you to you didn't need a visa to fly into the United States and and have a small layover and then go to the other country. There was uh, the screening requirements by the State Department were very were very loose at the time. So they were going to exploit that, avoid security, and get and, and smuggle smuggle weapons either in camera equipment or toys, and overpower the crew, uh, gain access to the cockpit, and fly uh, aircraft either into U.S. East Coast t targets or United Kingdom, Australia, and Italy. Uh, armed with this warning, uh, I would suspect that. The Federal Air Marshal Service then uh, began to increase its uh, activity, expand its numbers, perhaps, in, in, in order to ensure the safety of flights. Was that what happened? No, it was the alert was basically a heads up, watch out. This is very real. This is this is reliable intelligence, and we just want you guys to know that somebody might. Uh, use these weapons smuggled onto the aircraft and use them against you or use them against the crew. There was no change in any type of activity. Um, and of course, we know what happened just uh, two days afterwards. The, uh, 
there was a text message sent out to every single air marshal across the country. And the text message essentially said, we need you immediately to cancel all of your hotel reservations in order to avoid uh, uh, late, late, uh, late cancellation charges for hotel rooms. Uh, when I got what? What? They're, they're telling you you have to cancel your hotel reservations in the middle of this threat? Yes. Yes, absolutely. And what else did they tell you? Uh, well, to get clarification, we were supposed to call our operations people to, to get our new schedules and any more details. So when I made my phone call, I spoke to a, uh, a duty supervisor, um, and I asked him, what's going on? And he bluntly told me, he goes, this is a, uh, this is a headquarters decision. The agency has run out of money, and in order to save money, they need to completely cut out missions in which required air marshals to overnight in a hotel. And for how long would this go on? When at the time, the uh, they were they told me it was it was indefinite. We didn't know, but that they only could make the changes up until the ninth of August. When when uh, subsequent Inspector General reports came from the uh, Department of Homeland Security, the plan was supposed to be implemented on August 2nd of 2003, and the GAO report that came out afterwards reported that it was supposed to last until the end of the fiscal year, which would have made that uh, October 30th of 2003. So it would have been uh, two entire months in which air marshals were completely missing from these flights. Right after this threat was made. Yes, and, and there's something else to keep in mind. Um, we, there were, we were, we were uh, filing reports with Congress, with our supervisors, because since summer of 2002, when the new executive leadership took over the Air Marshal Service and gave us the military grooming standards where we can only, we could not have any, could have not have any beards. We had to have a mo uh, very short hair. We had to wear suits and ties. And we were, the check-in and boarding procedures essentially paraded us in front of the general passengers. Uh, for instance, we were boarding the aircraft in front of uh, families with small children or handicapped personnel. So you saw two, usually two big males uh, walking in front of everybody while everybody's getting in line for first class. May as well flash that badge instead, huh? That happened quite often. Uh, it wasn't, there were many times in which the gate agent simply said, uh, can I have the air marshals come to the counter for boarding? And sometimes we would, there would be a snafu in scheduling and the, uh, the airline would accidentally put somebody in our seat. Well, when the airline had to inform these people that their seat was being given away and the passenger would rightly get uh, very annoyed, the gate agent would just bluntly tell them, well, you're giving up your seat for airline security because an air marshal needs to sit in your seat. Now, faced with this budgetary crunch that the agency was under, uh, did they take any action in order to um, offset the uh, uh, the short the uh, financial shortfall? This is a, this is a this was the series of events. So, of course, now two whole months, air marshals were not going to be on these planes. And given those pol given those policies since early two thousand two, that everybody knew who we were, it's pretty obvious. I think for two entire months, people were going to notice air marshals are missing from flights. The day, the day immediately after the article uh, hit, it uh, spiraled. It was the front page of the Washington Post, CNN, Fox News, CBS News, all put out uh, reports. And immediately... Based on what? The fact that the air marshal, based uh, even after the uh, the DHS suicide terrorist 
uh, advisory that was issued on July 26th of 03 that air marshals, because the agency had misspent its funds and there wasn't any money left to save money on hotel costs associated with air marshals flying on long distance flights, Senators Hillary Clinton, Charles Schumer, Senator Barbara Boxer, and uh, uh, Republican Representative uh, Hal Rogers all went very public about this. And also, uh, I don't want to leave her out because she's been very supportive of me, is Congresswoman uh, Carolyn Maloney. And even uh, Senator Clinton issued a very detailed and uh, uh, very, uh, she hit on all points on aviation security, including the plan to uh, remove air, uh, air marshals from the, these long distance flights. Now, did you make a disclosure to Congress about this? No, I did not. Mm -hmm. I did not attempt to uh, to contact Congress prior to calling the media. I did make a. I called the Department of Homeland Security Inspector General hotline. I believe it got routed to per perhaps someplace around here in D.C. or Northern Virginia. I was rerouted to, and they asked me where I was based, and I told them Southern Nevada. And I was still anonymous. I wanted to re still remain anonymous. I was routed to an audit office in San Diego, and they said they couldn't help me. And they said, uh, then they gave me a number to their Oakland office, where they said a criminal investigator uh, should be able to help you. I spoke with a criminal investigator and told them what happened. And uh, he said, you know, you really don't want to uh, push this. Essentially, you know, do you really want to pick this battle? Do you want to? Do you want a long career? Do you want to continue? And I remember we had, he was, he was a nice guy. He was just giving me pretty fatherly advice. Mm -hmm. And we even discussed, he was a former FEMA uh, inspector general. And from then on, I kind of felt frustrated. The, it, was, it was a headquarters decision. The inspector general's office, who, who we're supposed to go to, they couldn't do anything. And I really don't fault them. I, mean, I don't fault the, the, the criminal investigator that I called. He can only do so much. But Congress was pretty outraged when they uh, became aware of these um, cutbacks of the air marshals on these long haul flights, weren't they? Yes, it was. It was very, very disturbing to watch the next day uh, when I saw a video uh, conference, video conference with Senator Clinton, Senator Schumer, Senator Boxer, uh, really just ripping the administration and. I have a lot of pride in, in my in my agency, and it was it was tough to see that because you know my own family and my friends are going, what the heck is going on with your agency? Uh, nobody likes to see you know. I had a lot of pride. I gave up everything for the agency, so it was really tough to watch uh, Tom Ridge getting grilled on national television uh, as to what happened. Now this was two thousand three. I'm gonna. Fast forward the story a little bit to 2006, if we can. You're still with the Federal Air Marshals at that time. Correct. And in 2006, suddenly you are, or... Well, maybe... the month after this disclosure, mm -hmm. I wanted to, I was tired of being anonymous. I wanted to do something right. It's ridiculous. It, nobody should have to be calling the media all the time to get things fixed. And I thought the best avenue was to form... A chapter within the Federal Law Enforcement Officers Association, along with uh, the who became president, was Frank Terreri. I ended up being his executive vice president, and together we decided to begin a new route of of addressing our complaints. Well, they were not well received with the management because we at first Frank Terreri was submitting these letters directly to the director. And to him, it was an absolute violation of the chain of command. And To the director. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, Frank Terreri started suffering from that. They removed him from flight status for almost a year. And almost appalling is after the Office of Professional Responsibility had cleared him for his investigation. For two months, they left him off of flight status after he was cleared, fully exonerated from the investigation. So... Our executive board w within the Federal Law Enforcement Officers Association, we were walking targets, and there were lots of investigations. 
eventually caught up with me. In 2006? Yes. And you- Absolutely. It was in May, May of 2005. I had a meeting with uh, uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement because we had, we, had, we had transferred from TSA to ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and to Office of, uh, Office of Professional Responsibility Investigators. Uh, called me up the day before and said, we're, we're, you're under investigation for uh, making unauthorized uh, releases to the media and unauthorized uh, disclosure of sensitive security information. Sensitive security information. This is classified information? No. Uh, sensitive security information, also known as SSI, is an unclassified information marking. It is not, you don't classify information with SSI. How do you Mark. know it, it is SSI then? Uh, according to the regulations of, uh, written by the, uh, by the TSA, everybody, every single employee has a obligation to mark any information that comes into their hands as SSI. So in 2003, when you disclosed to the media uh, the removal of air marshals from the long haul flights, was this information marked SSI? No, not only was it not marked as SSI, but instead of sending the text message to our encrypted, password-protected uh, personal data assistants, they sent them to our, our regular uh, uh, un- unprotected, unsecured uh, Nokia cell phones. And so in 2006, you're fired, right? I was, uh, they proposed my removal in September of 2005. You make it sound so friendly. They proposed your removal. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, they, it, it's definitely, it's not, they, uh, they don't uh, throw you out the window. It's a nice, uh, eventually I got a, a notice of removal um, on April 10th of 2006. And what was the ground that they gave for this removal? The, fr- the proposal originally had three charges. And the first two charges essentially were uh, violating policy for speaking to the media and providing them with uh, with unauth- with information that I'm not supposed to. This is the SSI. No, um, no. There were two. There were three charges total. Two of the charges were related to unauthorized uh, conversations with with media representatives. The third charge was unauthorized dis- unauthorized disclosure of SSI and that was the only charge that they that they that they gave me in my removal notice and really and they were they were very very nice because in my removal notice they cited my unblemished record they cited cited my unblemished military record and my unblemished uh, federal law enforcement record uh, but they said that I could I was no longer fit to be a, uh, a federal agent anymore and so, have you challenged this? Yes, I did. I filed a, uh, a petition for in the Regional Merit Systems Protection Board in San Francisco. And next month, it will have been three years that I have not had one hearing with the uh, Merit Systems Protection Board. And so, what are you doing? How are you staying alive? Uh, I'm living with my parents. I've had I've been lucky to been given uh, to have some financial aid, but I have I've applied for eight different uh, local police departments in my areas, and other than my removal for uh, unauthorized disclosure of SSI, I had a perfect record. And the general response after application was, uh, "We're sorry, you're not the uh, you were not one of the most qualified." please reapply another time. And I grew frustrated and I figured I'm pretty much not even going to get a job in local law enforcement. And that's when I, uh, I opened up a, a small business in the worst economy um, in probably both of our generations. And it's tough to say I'm, I'm going to probably very soon have to... Uh, file for not only for bankruptcy of my company, but for personal bankruptcy. Uh, but right now I'm surviving, uh, taking care of my, 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 uh, my, uh, sick mother who she's, uh, she's bedridden, uh, 24 seven. So 
I given have. all of this, I mean, you've suffered tremendously uh, for having come forward with this information. Do you regret having done it? No, I don't regret it. But if somebody wants to do what I did, I really would like to have a heart-to-heart conversation. And um, what would you tell them? Go, this is what happens. You need to be ready to lose your identity. If you're a law enforcement officer, uh, you're, you're going to be blacklisted. You're going to be labeled as a snitch, a rat, a tattler. Uh, nobody's going to want you in, uh, in their office because they don't want to risk uh, having their own skeletons being uh, exposed out of, the co- out of the closet. Your family is going to, at first, embrace you. The media says you're a hero, but uh, the media can't, uh, can't give you your job back. Uh, no matter how responsible the media is and the re- reporting, and I believe that the media that handled my disclosures, very, very responsible. But it's still not good enough to take on the Goliath of, uh, the, or the, the wrath of a federal agency. And your friends think, your family and your friends, they go, do you, do you really, they start to question your sanity. They say, well, why did you do this? Why are you trying to be a hero? If it's not going to hurt you or it's not going to hurt your family, just turn a blind eye. If, if, every, if they all die, at least it wasn't you. But it's not worth uh, losing, your, losing your career over. Well, uh, personally, I have to thank Robert McLean as someone who does make long-haul flights that he was looking out for me and for you and for the rest of us. And hopefully, we'll look out for him and make sure that this right, this wrong is righted. I'm Mark Cohen, and this has been Whistle Where You Work.